Just look at the person next to you and tell them, you look like you've lost weight. How did you pull that off? Just ask them, how did they manage that? <clears throat> Just uh, real quick before we uh, go any further, I wanted to remind you next Sunday is a very important day uh, for our uh, vote to uh, approve a mortgage for our expansion. And so uh, you'll be able to, if you are a member of Calvary Assembly family, you'll be able to register when you come in uh, at the Welcome Center. Uh, you'll be given a ballot. You can cast that ballot at any time during the day. There are some who may desire more information or an opportunity to ask some questions. And so following the third service, there'll be a business meeting and anyone uh, is welcome to attend it. Uh, the actual balloting can only be completed by official members, but anyone is welcome to that meeting and to ask questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. So just wanted you to be aware of that. So um, it really was one of the moments I'm most ashamed of in my life. I was on a missions trip to India, and uh, India is a hard place to go. Uh, there's a lot you have to be concerned about. You're giving all kinds of warnings before you go about uh, what kinds of foods you can and can't eat, should and shouldn't eat, and water, unless it comes from a bottle that is sealed, is just completely off limits. You don't even rinse your toothbrush in water that uh, flows out of a, a spigot. Uh, the people who live there have an immune system that tolerates, but uh, from America, uh, we don't. So when I go on these missions trips, there's lots of opportunities to speak, and uh, they, they load you up. You'll, you'll speak more than once in a day. And when I've gone, I've gone for almost three weeks at a time. And the weekends you would typically have off, they don't have classes for pastors and, and ministers who are, are learning to become a little bit more uh, confident in their skills. So they would usually send us out to one of the village churches. And... Uh, so I was assigned to Village Church, a uh, driver came, he was also the interpreter for the day, picked me up and, and we left behind everything that looked like a, a village or a town at all or a city or a town, went into this remote village, it took us a while to get there and, and when we did, the place of worship was very, very small, very, very plain. Uh, but where they took us first was to the pastor's home and the pastor's home was literally a, a two-room hut uh, that had dirt floors. And I had been told that among the things that you were not supposed to eat was fruit, and the person who was my interpreter and the driver was supposed to communicate that to people so that they would not offer me something. And so when I went in and I was introduced to the pastor and his family, he had a wife and one child, he looked around this very sparse dirt floor hut looking for something that he could give to me, and all he had was an apple. And he gave me the apple, and I looked with a little bit of fear in my eyes to the person who was with me and assigned to take care of me that day. And I'm saying, this is where you're supposed to step in. And he didn't do anything. So I trusted that the people couldn't hear me say anything in English. And I just said, I'm not supposed to eat this. And the guy looked at me and he said, eat it. <laughs> and, and I was a little bit annoyed, a little bit afraid. And that's when it happened. I looked at the pastor and I said, no, thank you. I'm full. And that's when I learned one of the most devastating lessons I could possibly know in life. That when we are full, we become less gracious. And I immediately saw what I had done. I could see it in the look in his eyes. And so I asked for a knife, and I peeled off the, the outer layer of the apple, hoping that whatever was on it that would get me was on the outside, not on the inside. And I, I ate the apple and, and tried to make up for my amends. We all struggle with the illusion that we'd be more grateful if we had more. It's simply not true. We are the least grateful when we are full. There's this passage of scripture in Colossians I'd like to just look at this morning for a few minutes. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 15, it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be, next word, be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and 
songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it as clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Once again, the illusion is if I had more, I would be more grateful. But we have a lot, and sometimes we forget. Our life is a gift. Our health is a gift. All you have to do is lose some of it, and you realize how valuable it is. Friends are a gift. Your job is a gift. Maybe you're sitting here going, not my job. No, it might not be your only job or your last job, but it's temporary provision between now and the next thing, and it's a gift. I know a number of people are struggling these days with um, early dementia, Alzheimer's. They would tell you that a sound mind is a gift. The strength is a gift. Love is a gift. Food is a gift. How many enjoyed some good food this week? Yeah. Sunrises and sunsets, though they are often obscured by the clouds in our region, they are gifts. Insight is a gift. Knowledge is a gift. Wisdom is a gift. Your education is a gift. Children are a gift. Grandchildren are a gift. God's word, it's a gift. Forgiveness, it's a gift. Our relationship with God, it's a gift. And we forget how much we have because we are full. They tell me that one of the leading causes of death in the United States is heart disease. And that comes from sometimes hereditary things. You're just born with the deck stacked against you, and, and uh, you, you can kind of slow some processes down, but you can't eliminate them. Other things like diet or exercise can play a role. I think there's a spiritual heart disease that we are all born with, too. It's hereditary. We seem to have wounds that will not heal. We have a numbness that keeps us from being able to feel. We have attitudes that will not kneel. We have love that isn't real. And this is a hereditary thing. We, we all possess it. And the passage that we just read gives us incredible insight on how if we will engage in gratitude and thankfulness, it actually has a healing influence on our spiritual heart. And so I'd like to look at the five ways that that occurs today. And the first is found in verse 16. It says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. You see, when you learn to live in gratitude, you actually gain wisdom. You gain wisdom. Uh, we begin to discover that there really are better ways to live. Sometimes it's learned through painful experience. Sometimes it's learned from insights. Sometimes it's learned from lessons that we learn from someone else. But these are incredible gifts. So what happens is, is when we learn these things, we can begin to share these things. Um, I was in a, a seminar recently where a guy was talking about some of his weaknesses and how he had to navigate them in order to be effective in ministry. And he was so incredibly vulnerable that the wisdom he shared didn't offend a single person that was in the room. Why? Because he would learned this lesson a hard and painful way. And he understood what it was like to be under the burden of that. You, you gain this capacity when, when you live a grateful life you, you, you experience this wisdom, and then you want to share it just because you're grateful. And here's the amazing thing, too, is you're willing to receive that wisdom from someone else, and you're grateful for what God has taught them. Uh, second thing that can happen when we engage in gratitude is continuing on that verse. It says, through psalms, hymns, and songs in the Spirit, singing, with, uh, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Your worship begins to have more passion in it. Your worship has more passion. You don't just go through the motions. And I'm not suggesting that your emotions are always going to be flying high when you come into rooms like this, especially on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. We're all a little bit hungover. And uh, we've just had a few too many sweets and too many carbs. And, and, and some of you will not actually remember that you were here today. 
So maybe we should take a picture in case you need evidence. But if we begin to run an inventory on the things that God has done for us, something begins to happen to the words as we say them and to our heart. We notice our emotions begin to rise. Um, I do a fair amount of counseling, uh, premarital counseling and then counseling after people are married. And the premarital counseling is always so much fun because they love each other so much, they want to spend the rest of their lives together. And then after people are married, they come in and they want to know, what mistake have I made? And <laughs> is there any way I can fix this? And I can always tell when a marriage is in trouble, passion-wise. And it's because the person is keeping a very good inventory on what they are doing for the marriage and the other person. I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. I've done. They've got their list down. But if you ask them what the other person has done, they don't recognize anything. It's a very simple exercise. If you actually want to improve the passion levels in your marriage, all you have to do is start paying attention to what the other person is already doing for you. And if you think they're not doing anything, it's not because they're not doing anything. It's because you're not seeing it. Yeah. Well, I'm doing more. Well, it's not a contest. Right? Something. And just that if you want your passion levels to rise with God, just start taking an inventory not on what you are doing for him, but what he is doing for you. Does that make sense? What kind of things does he do for us? Well, how about he forgives every single fault and failure? No exceptions. It's amazing. He embraces us before we deserve it. If you've ever had a person in your life who made you wallow in your own guilt and shame a sufficient amount of time before they were willing to offer forgiveness, it's a painful thing to have to walk through. But it's the only time God actually interrupts us. While we're rehearsing our speech to him of how bad we are, he interrupts us and embraces us. He wraps us up in his arms and squeezes life back into us. And he constantly commits to restoring us to his purpose and plan for our lives. And he never stops doing that. And we can be very grateful for that. Third thing, it's found in verse 17. It says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. A person who lives out gratitude, you begin to allow spiritual things to spill over into every part of life. It's not just segregated to rooms like this. Gratitude really isn't something that you can separate into certain environments. Once you become a, a great-filled person, a, a, a thankful person, it just begins to ooze out wherever you are. Now, some people think, well, that's just a mind hack. That's just, that's just a trick. You're pretending. Let me tell you, there's a lot of pretending that goes on in the world, but it doesn't happen in gratitude. The pretending that happens in our world, here's a pretense that you earned everything you have. That's a lot of pretending goes on in our world. Or, or how about this one? That your life doesn't really have any real purpose or meaning. That's a way to pretend too. And it's not a good way to live. When we start living out our faith, and by this I'm not talking about telling other people what the rules are that they should be adhering to. Sharing your rules is not the same thing as sharing your faith. But once gratitude begins to, to flow out of you, it, it spills over into everywhere you go. And here's the most amazing thing. Gratitude opens doors. It's ingratitude that closes them. Nothing is more offensive to us when we've done something for someone and they are completely ungrateful and unthankful. And so once we learn in, in a house of worship, a, a spiritual space where we can go out and show that gratitude to others, God has been so gracious to us, we can be gracious with others. It's life-changing. Fourth thing, it's found in uh, chapter 4, verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And this, this is what's really powerful is that when we ex exercise gratitude and thankfulness, it actually helps us to pray more confidently. You actually begin to pray more confidently. How does that work? Well, what we begin to do is when we are noticing all the things that God is giving into our lives, it builds our confidence that he is incredibly generous towards us. And if he's generous towards us, he will also be generous towards others. And if he's liberal with us, he'll be liberal with others. And when we acknowledge that in our own lives, it boosts our confidence. It boosts our confidence. 
And then the fifth thing is found in Colossians 4, verse 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let me, how many here have ever had a moment when you were speechless? And how many that created some awkwardness for you? Yeah. Um, by reason of my profession, I get asked to say grace a lot. It's just, oh, the pastor's here. I've, I've been at weddings that I didn't perform. I was at the reception. I didn't even know anybody there knew me other than the bride and groom. And the, and the, 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 the DJ is kind of introducing everybody. Now, before we have our meal, is Pastor Reeves in the room? And I go, how do you know? <laughs> Would you come up and, and say grace? And I've always just wanted to go up and say, grace. And they, but, now, you have to be prepared for moments like that. Something that, oh, doesn't that just flow out of you? Oh, something will, but it's not necessarily good. <laughs> you have to think about this stuff. We get caught off guard. And here's what I want you to see about this. Uh, when we get caught off guard, what we can learn to do is to be thankful and grateful, and if you're paying attention to the things that are around you, then you begin to have better and healthier communication. You have something to say. You have something good to say. Because you've been watchful, because you've been paying attention to the good things, you have something good to say. We've all had moments when someone, we were on the receiving end of someone's sarcasm, or the way they painted a story in such a way that we were the the bad character in it. Those are painful moments. But I'm guessing at some point in your life you had someone who spoke grace into you. They said something to you in a way that made you want to hear more. And when people talk like that, it makes a difference. You remember those conversations. So here's, if you notice the things constantly around you to be grateful for, you will always have something gracious to say. Just notice the good things that are around you. Uh, just one more point I want to make today, and it is be thankful for what you can do. Be thankful for what you can do. It, it said in Colossians, the third chapter, whatever you do, whether word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Um, let, let's just see. How many here are reasonably proficient in the kitchen when you, when you make things people like to eat them? Okay. Uh, that, that's not really me. I, I can make things that people don't die from. It's not quite the same thing. <laughs> and uh, so when it came to Thanksgiving this year, um, Sue did an outstanding job on the turkey. In fact, she was told it's the best turkey she's ever made. And uh, she, she makes, uh, well, you know, all the food that goes along with it. But one of the highlights is she makes lemon meringue pie and she makes Toll House cookie pie. And she asked me, would you like a piece of lemon meringue pie or Toll House cookie pie? And I said, yes. <laughs> Why choose if you don't have to? I'll, I'll take one of each. And so she is really good at doing that. And, and Everybody said, the pie, this is the best pie you've ever made. This is the best turkey you've ever made. And she believes it's because she's a grandmother now and some magic from heaven has descended upon her. And, and maybe it has, I don't know. So people ask, well, what do you do, Pastor? And I go, That's fair. I can eat. I'm good at that. Um, the, I don't really make, I don't do much to prepare the food, but there's a couple of things I do. One is I slice the turkey and uh, I carve the turkey. And, and you might not know this about me, but when it comes to turkey carving, I am a savant. <laughs> I, am, I was going to bring a picture of my turkey carving, and I decided not to because I didn't want you to feel badly about your own turkey carving. <laughs> it's not a, good, not a good thing. I mean, Martha Stewart, if she saw the turkey that I carved, she would go, that is a really good job. Who did that? And so I carved the turkey, and <laughs> some of you are looking at me like, what is going on? 
I also help with dishes. I'm not a savant in cleaning dishes, but I'm, I'm, I'm capable of cleaning dishes, and I, and I help out. And here's the thing. It is so easy to get caught up in the fact that I had to do something that we forget that we were able to do something. That maybe when you cook something, people compliment it. Or when you do something, it helps others. And what Paul is telling us here is whatever it is that you're able to do, do it with thanksgiving because you're able to do it. We have to get out of this mindset that says, I had to. You were able to. It might not be the most enjoyable task in the world. It might take something out of you. It might be challenging, but at the end of the day, you were able to do it. So God has not called us to do everything, but God has called us to do something. We all have a part to contribute. And when we do that, it's amazing how much reason there is for gratitude and thankfulness in our world. So I'm going to give you a homework assignment. I know some of you won't do it. Do not be afraid. I am not going to check up on you in any way, all right? But I recommend starting a gratitude journal. And a gratitude journal, by the way, if, if you have ever gone to a counselor, this is something, if you're struggling with depression, um, this is one of the things that they will recommend, along a, a number of other things that they will prescribe. But they will recommend that you, you start noticing things like this. What is something you enjoyed today? What is something you enjoyed today? Um, there is one piece of lemon meringue pie in the refrigerator that is left. <laughs> At least it was still there when I left this morning. <laughs> and so hopefully I will get to enjoy that today and that can go into my gratitude journal. What is something you were able to do today? You had the ability, the capability, the competence, the skill to actually do something. A third, what is something you learned today? Because there are lessons in every single day if we will pay attention to them and they benefit us. That's how wisdom flows into our lives. And if we're willing, that wisdom can flow through our lives. And then who were you able to spend some time with that if they were no longer with you? You would miss a lot. Who's that? And if you can just jot down, it only takes a couple of minutes. And by the way, you don't actually have to have a, a physical journal, any smart device. You can start a note. And day after day, just what did I enjoy today? What was I able to do today? You know, what, who did I get to spend some time with today? If they weren't around, I would miss a lot. And that information can make a huge difference in your life. The more we become grateful, the more room we have to receive more gifts of God's grace. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, I, I don't want in any way to make light of the fact that maybe you're going through a really difficult season in life. Um, there's probably a number of people who would say that life is wearying right now, especially as we head into the holiday season. For some people, it becomes really difficult. And I'm not here to tell you that that's not true. I'm not going to tell you that the load isn't heavy or the work isn't hard or that you have everything that you would desire but I'm here to tell you that it's not the only thing that's true, that there are good things that are in your life. And when you pause and you notice and you convert that observation into a prayer, just saying thank you to God, that your capacity to experience more and express more is enlarged. Um, you find yourself growing in wisdom you find yourself able to share with others. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us today. Help us notice all the good things you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.